Thanks for tuning in to Playbooks Football Games of the Week on the RLADS Football Network, the RLADS Football YouTube channel. I'm host Greg De Palma, and joining me, of course, is Mark Lawrence from Playbook Experts YouTube channel and PlaybookSports.com as we take a look at the key games in college football and the NFL this week. Uh, we're going to be breaking down the key trends, the updated point spreads. We're also going to go into futures like the Heisman uh, college football championship futures. Uh, we've got our, uh, I guess you can call it, uh, under the radar games of the week, our top double digit point spread picks of the week. And we can kind of start off there, Mark, because uh, we struck gold in week one in college football uh, with our double digit upset outright wins of the week uh, with Sam Houston State uh, beating Rice. They were a three to one dog, a 10 point underdog. And to, to qualify, of course, it's got to be a double-digit upset outright. Yes. Uh, yep. So that's what Sam Houston did. And Boston College was even better because that line kept going up to Florida State. I think it was, what, up to 19 by game yes. time? Yes. Yeah. So the what was the money line? About six? Something like that? I think so. Right around there, yeah. yes. Right. So uh, excellent. Of course, I only uh, had the Sam Houston one. Mark was all over the Boston College one. Mark doesn't get into uh, – 10 point uh, money line plays as much as I do, but he had one whenever he has one, he'll definitely share it. Uh, so yes, uh, we're uh, going to get right into it. So let's do that. Uh, there are, and, and coming up a little bit later on in the, in, in, in this uh, week's show, we're going to be talking in every week because we're recording this every week around four o'clock Eastern. So uh, what we're going to do is, is our first talk will be in the NFL. We're also going to have, uh, markers on the bottom of the screen. You can check it out if you want to fast forward to our NFL talk. We're always going to start with the Thursday night game. So in case you get this video a few hours before kickoff, you want to know what we're talking about regarding the Thursday night game of the week, you can go ahead and uh, check that out. All right. But first is college football. And <clears throat> there is a, a, a game on Friday night in college football. But before we uh, get to the Friday night uh, games that we want to talk about, uh, I just want to uh, just would like for us to do a quick recap of what happened last week. I think there were four big games last week uh, to talk about Georgia Clemson game got off to a kind of sluggish start for the first half. And then Georgia just, uh, just got more talent. I just think and Clemson's got no offense. That's what the problem is. And I, I think if Clemson had an offense, I think that could have been a game, but when you don't have an offense, your defense could only hang on for so long and Georgia just uh, – it was just too much for Clemson. Bad sign for Clemson. And we were all over it in the ACC with a lot of experts thinking it was uh, going to be a, a same old Clemson and Florida State. They were going to be in the ACC championship game. Neither one of us bought that. Actually, you liked Clemson, but it was very important for you to see what happened in that first game against Georgia to find out whether or not you were going to be true to Dave Sweeney and uh, whether or not he had anything left in the tank not going down the transfer portal. So obviously you had to be majorly disappointed by that Clemson game. I think the whole country was disappointed, uh, Greg, as you mentioned. There were two big games that were bet in Vegas that were steamed. I mean, they were the biggest steam dogs, live dogs. People thought they are going to win the games, and they both completely tanked. One was Clemson uh, in that football game against Georgia. Everybody thought that they would pull the upset or at least stay close, uh, despite the fact that uh, DJU, the quarterback, uh, he has not been making mistakes, but I think there's an offensive coordinator problem going on there. This offense just does not move the football. Now, maybe it was the Georgia defense. You can't say that for sure because they're awfully, awfully good. The other game that uh, the whole betting world was on, and I don't like it when the public and the Sharps are both on underdogs because uh, it's a double-edged sword, if you will, per se that way, was West Virginia. Uh, you know, Everybody thought that they were a live home dog against Penn State. And uh, in the football game, that was kind of drawn out in the sense that there was a real long rain delay, two hour, two or three hour rain delay. Two I hours. Think, how, how long? Two hours. Yeah. I, and I, I know really because I do the Penn State post game shows on the Penn State YouTube channel. And uh, yeah, I, I wasn't able to uh, get that going live until like six o'clock, six thirty. Wow. Well, I, well, well, during the uh, rain delay, about an hour and 45 minutes into it, I was beginning to think. 
hey, we might get a uh, we might get this game postponed and canceled, and uh, we can bail out of our play here. But <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> it didn't happen. <laughs> no. But th- those were the two games that uh, I was surprised to see the underdogs no show in last week. As I remind everybody, uh, because we're always going to get new viewers, uh, you can check out Mark's uh, Playbook magazine. Uh, this is uh, year 34? 34, yes. 34. So um, this is everything for a handicapper, a college and pro. And I'm always going to be referencing this on a weekly basis with the trends. And this was the trend I brought up last week, which is why I like Penn State. Penn State is now 16-0 and straight up. 12 and 2 against the spread during the first five games of the season, the last three years in one game. So yep. that uh, was very impressive to me. And, uh, and, and and there you go. And I also like the fact uh, that, that Penn State had beaten West Virginia by 23 points last year. The line was 21. They brought the line down to seven. I thought that was a lot to bring down when Penn State proved that they were better. I know they got a late touchdown, so it wasn't really a late touchdown. They got, they got a stick it in your rear end. touchdown. Yeah. Yeah. So it should have been a 16. Uh, uh, And by the way, there is a game or two that I want that similar to what happened at Penn State that we'll talk about a little bit later on, as far as the way those lines drop that I'm not so sure that should be the case. Okay. So uh, that was last week and let's, uh, well, that was one of the games from last week, actually. Uh, let's, let's go through a couple of the others, and that is the uh, Miami-Florida matchup. And we both agreed that Miami was a more talented team when we were handicapping this game. But that doesn't always mean that the most talented team is going to win. And, of course, there's a lot of questions about Mario Cristobal's coaching or all that other stuff that we went over. Uh, of course, I have Miami winning, the, uh, getting to the ACC championship game. So I was all bought in. Um, I thought this game was going to be a lot closer, a lot tougher, but you know what the problem is going on with Napier? This is the reason why I think it's, it's, I think it might be done for him is that they were a very undisciplined team last year. And you saw a very undisciplined team again in week one, you had the entire off season to fix the, dis- the discipline and it, it was not fixed. And, uh, and, and look, the, the offense was, was overmatched, but, I was surprised at just how easily Miami was able to move up and down the field. You know, it, to the point where, Greg, I had to stop and think and ask myself, have we ever seen an in-season firing and hiring of a coach from another school in the same move? If Florida gets rid of Billy Napier and just decides that they want to go out and hire a group of five coach who's currently coaching, uh, has there ever been a, a situation where the, he's left that school in during season and taken on the new job with the Power Five conference? Oh, okay. Do you have a suggestion or? I don't know. I just all I'm saying is, uh, you know, there, there's some good talent, John Summerall. There, a lot of good talent at the at the Group of Five level. It is Florida. Purpose. Yeah, it is Florida. Yes. So exactly, but you know, Florida is going to be one of those schools that is going to be reviewing a lot of resumes here in the off season. Believe yeah. Me. Uh, probably not going to happen on, unless it happens next week, unless, cause they're playing an FCS team, I think this week. So if they lose to this, uh, they lose this week, then yeah, the job will be open on yep. Monday, uh, or Sunday and then we'll see, but yeah, doubtful, but, uh, one of those things where, uh, you would think they're, they're already preparing for the possibility that if they get off to a slow start, they have to, I mean, that's, you, you can't be doing your job at Florida if you're not preparing for that uh, inevitability, which it looks like is the case for Miami though. You had to be impressed uh, because you can say all you want about negative Florida and negative this and that. Uh, not that it was a close game for Mario Cristobal to be able to prove his chops as a, as a, you know, a, can he get the job done when the game's on the line, but, See, this is the thing. If you're a great recruiter, which he is, same thing in college basketball, you could still win a ton of games. You can come close to winning championships, but do you have what it takes? Because sooner or later in the big game, they're going to be big games. Can you win those big games? And that's been his problem so far, but not at Miami. I think now it's obvious after just one week, that boy, he's got a load of talent, and he he doesn't even have to worry probably about coaching in close games very often this year. Um, and now we'll you know, so I think that's going to be something that is going to benefit him greatly. Well, you know, you say you can get away with a lot when you recruit and you go deep with talent, and that's true. 
but at some point you're going to have to out coach the other coach. Yep. And you know, that's my biggest, uh, what I'm uh, resident most about reticent most about with Mario Cristobal. I don't know if he can out coach another, another good coach. Okay. Maybe the coaches that are uh, not so good, but, uh, uh, he's got the talent. He always does have the talent. The question is, can he out X and out O the opposing coach? And we saw last year when he just blew a football game because of a call in the situation and a timeout and all that type of stuff. That's just lack of fundamentals. And, yep. you know, at some point, Greg, I can assure you, you can mark this down. I don't know what day it'll be. We'll be talking about another Mario Cristobal Fupa that happens throughout the course of this football season this year. It's just going to happen. It's inevitable. The good news for their schedule is uh, they really are going to be expected to win uh, over the next month. They may have a test at the end of the month, uh, but really the tough test doesn't come until at Louisville on October 19th, and that is already six games into the season. That'll be game seven. Then the back-to-back Louisville-Florida State. Other than that, they're also at Georgia Tech. That's exactly where the the, the big uh, – a mistake happened if you want to just <laughs> let him uh, off the hook uh, with, with with that term. But the fact is, is uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a pretty decent schedule now that they've gotten past Florida. Because, hey, Miami, they SEC team on the road, we, we don't know how good or bad they were. Gonna, we, we put it on the schedule. We went up against them. That's going to work in a, in a positive way uh, for the committee at the end of the season if they don't win the ACC championship and lose the ACC championship game. So, all right. It, and it most likely will I agree with that hundred percent. Now the other two games, Notre Dame and Texas A&M are Aggies were, were uh, mildly upset by Notre Dame. Uh, I was, the only thing I was disappointed with Texas A&M was just, I expected a little bit more from Wigman, the quarterback. Uh, I know how good Notre Dame's defense is. I still expected a little bit more from Wigman. But first of all, he's young. Uh, again, new system and all that. So this is why it's first game. And it's not going to affect Texas A&M's chances in the least. They've still got a long way to go. They, they get to the SC Championship game. They've got the ticket to the playoffs. What I came out of that game was, was very impressed with Notre Dame. Now, I still don't know about their offense, especially their passing game. Uh, it looks like they, they, they can run the ball a little bit. But outside of that, and we know they got a quarterback that's a gamer, but boy, that defense is so good. Uh, we talked about my, my example about Michigan and what they're going to try to do this year. I mentioned this on your show, the Playbook Experts uh, Weekly Show. That's a, that, that's available on your channel. Uh, that I think what Michigan's trying to do this year is try to go back to their national championship de- uh, uh, season when Brian Greasy led a, a, a really a, a defensive team uh, to a championship. Their offense was bad. But he just didn't do making mistakes. They let the defense dominate. They won games thirteen to three and twenty to three, and they, and and that's how they won it. But that's how I really think. But I don't think Michigan could do that because they don't have the quarterback. But I think this is a perfect example for Notre Dame on how they're going to want to try to win the championship this year. They've got like a Brian Greasy type quarterback in Leonard. They don't have much else going on on offense, but that defense is maybe the best defense in college football. It's that good. What's well, good? We're going to find out if it's the best. Uh, you know, it's statistically, there's other cases to be made for other schools, but it is good. It's big and it's uh, really, really staunch. Uh, I'm also not going to dismiss Michigan's defense this football season as yeah. well. Uh, if for no other reason, Wink Martindale is running the show over there, and Wink Martindale knows how to out defense and out coach other offensive opponents. So, you know, we'll keep an eye on those two teams. I think they're going to step up both defensively. Yeah, what a what a break for Michigan to have an NFL coordinator like that yes. on their sidelines. Uh, but again, remember this is the thing we talked about with Notre Dame. They do not have a tough schedule, so this was a major win for them because they still were in good shape even if they lost a close game the way their schedule was. But looking at their schedule, they do have Louisville at home. They got Georgia Tech neutral site. Uh, Florida State will be at home, um, and then the other toughest game is now going to be at USC. At the last game of the season, as I segue to the to the Sunday night game between USC and LSU, probably the best game of the week because of the fact that you had two really good teams. And it was interesting when you see the rankings in the game and you saw USC 21 and LSU 13, I, I was like going, wait a second. I, I feel like I'm watching a game of two teams in the top 10. 
Yes, I mean, for sure. these are really good football teams. We had no idea how good USC was going to be. We felt the LSU, Kelly, they were good, reasonably good last year. We knew they were going to be, uh, you know, a, a playoff contender, but we had no idea what to expect from USC. But boy, we talked about USC's defense being the 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 the, the, uh, the changes there. Uh, they've got a coordinator, a very young coordinator, uh, that is a rising star in the game. And you saw how tough their defense was. We haven't seen USC's defense like this since Pete Carroll. That's how tough this defense was. And they got a quarterback that looks fantastic. He's not Caleb Williams, but who is? He might be. (laughs) But he's young, you know. He's young. He's still a very good quarterback. A little small. He's only six foot, you know, 200. So, but still, this is college. We're not talking about the NFL. Fact is, he's an excellent quarterback. This is a good football team. And, I'm sorry, but I think USC, after just watching one game, they might be the team. They might be. They, 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 I put them right there now uh, in the mix with Ohio State, Oregon, and Penn State for the Big Ten Championship. Well, I vaulted them into the Our Lads top 12 poll. Oh, week. I haven't seen that yet. Yes. Yeah, I, have, yeah. I have to get that from you. Yes. Yeah, I, sent, I just sent that just before we went on. Okay. And, and I moved them up in the top 12 or top 10. And, uh, you know, I think they're going to be really, really good this year. I think. Lincoln Riley's got something to prove this football season. And, you know, a lot of what he did in the past, you know, he, oh, he had a Heisman Trophy winning quarterback and uh, all this talent and so forth and whatnot. But now it's Lincoln Riley. He's going to have to outcoach other teams. And I think he's capable of doing just that. And what a game it was. I think it was the best game to watch, have watched last weekend. Yeah. And uh, that's actually going to be another segue for me, like how we're segueing, uh, segueing the show. Uh, into the futures for the week and that is because i only have one team that i'm gonna i'm gonna add to my championship futures list this week two of them that i was considering but i'm gonna wait because i can wait they're not playing anybody tough this week the odds are still you know notre dame at 16 to 1 penn state at 20 to 1 but the team that i'm adding is usc they're 60 to 1 to win the national championship and I just think they proved to me in one game that 60 to one, that's like taking candy from a baby. They just keep what, playing like what, this. What are their big 10 road games? Uh, do you have that in front of you there, Greg? Yeah. Overall, uh, let's see. They are going to be starting their first matchup. Get this. Their first big 10 game ever at Michigan in two oh. weeks. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Wake up. Hello. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Then they're at Minnesota, at Maryland, at Washington, and at UCLA. Those are all winnable games. So those, so they have one really tough road game against Michigan. And then the home games, Wisconsin, tough. Penn State, tougher. Rutgers, tough. Nebraska, tough. And then again, as I mentioned, USC Notre Dame at the end of the season, November the 30th, not a Big Ten game, but – we, we, you know, this is one of those rivalries that we like watching, but it hasn't really meant anything for the last several years. But it's now, going through this year, yes. Yeah, it could mean a lot this year. Yes. So, yeah, uh, check that out. Uh, USC, again, invest in them. I did at 60 to 1. Let's talk about the other uh, futures before we move on to this week's games. Uh, I have four more add ons to my Heismans uh, and uh, to my Heisman portfolio. And I'll be sharing this with you in in upcoming shows so you can get caught up with all of these uh, future plays that I have. Uh, But my Heisman pickups this week, Drew Aller, uh, of course, from Penn State, the quarterback. You know, we have to be there. Has to be on that list. Yes. He looked really good in in their win against West Virginia. And then I have other long shots. I mean, seriously, I think this is look, I know I know it's going to be rare for a non power five player to win the Heisman. But if anybody can do it, especially if you're going to be doing it from the running back position, it might be Ashton Gentry, the court, the running back from Boise. This kid is awesome. Uh, he's just amazing. I mean, if you watch the Georgia Southern game, which actually in my mind was one of the fun games to watch in college football this past week, it was a really good football game. Uh, but Gentry is an amazing running back. Uh, so uh, he's at a hundred to one. Casey, yeah, we'll get to see him against Oregon this week. That'll be interesting. Oh, yeah. yes. right. Yep. So check that out. That's a great promo because Genty's up against Oregon. My next pick is 200 to 1, Casey Concepcion. He was the freshman uh, of the year last year in college football for the ACC. 
Uh, he's a fantastic wide receiver. He's playing at against Tennessee this week. And then I said, why, you know, why not put a, a buck or two on Zachariah Branch, the wide receiver slash kick returner for USC? I mean, that kid is electric. He gets the ball in his hands, and you never know if he's going to score a touchdown. He's a young well, kid. If he finds the end zone often enough, <laughs> you yeah. won't see 200 to 1 on him for sure. You know? Exactly. So there right. you go. I figured, why not take advantage of those uh, odds at this point uh, in the uh, in the season? Okay, so let's go ahead and get ready to uh, go over our week two uh, trends and picks. Uh, I do have to uh, ask you, and I know if you, if you could you could find this out again, check out, and I'll have a link in the description for uh, the playbook uh, show that we do each week, uh, going over the NFL and college football. But Victor King uh, talked about uh, a trend where he had four uh, stinker teams. Do you remember what that trend was? Uh, the stinker teams uh, were Akron, Charlotte, Houston, and Temple. And I just don't remember what the trend was, but I, just before we came on the air, or else I would have checked it, I was like, I saw my notes from, from, from yesterday, and I go, oh, that's right, I forgot about this. This is something to, to bring up. But, yeah, it was a trend that Victor thought was important. He just said, yeah, it's a really good trend. There's a lot of good numbers that say you should take these teams, but the problem is these teams, as, as I as I read off, are not very good. Well, I, I believe it had to do with them being uh, b- big, ugly dogs, beyond ugly dogs, okay? Uh, but it's more their opponent, and I believe – Check me if I'm wrong, but did the opponents come off of wins and covers their last games, and now they're laying these monstrous numbers? Let's see. I know Temple is going uh, – excuse me. Um, Temple is taking on Navy. So, yeah, Navy won against an FCS team. Houston is going up against Oklahoma. They blew out Temple. Charlotte, uh, they were blown out. Uh, oh, wait, North Carolina is their opponent, and they were not – they only no. won by two. Right. And Akron got blown out by higher State. So Charles, the, number, the uh, right. misnomer in there. Right. So, but yeah, but you know what? You want to know what it was? Go to the link, check out the show. And it was towards the end of the show. Yes, it so was. So check out the end, towards the end of the show. One of the last things that Victor talked about. It, it was a know, jaw dropping stat too. It was, yes. Yeah. I, so check that out because you don't want to probably take my word for it. Telling you to bet Akron, Charlotte, Houston, and Temple, <laughs> because even with those, <laughs> with that credible stats, I'm not even sure I can do it. So it's a tough one. <laughs> Uh, all right, now let's go into the games. And uh, there are actually a couple games coming up on Friday night. Uh, one of them uh, is going to be uh, Duke and Northwestern. So I just wanted to throw this in there because Duke, I actually thought this line was going to be a, a little bit lo- lo- uh, bigger for Northwestern, uh, but they're only a two and a half point spread. But if you keep an eye, but, but maybe this is a big reason. Duke has won five straight, straight up and against the spread versus Northwestern by 161 to 84. So they have dominated this series. This isn't something that happened 20 years ago. This is recent. This is like the last 10 years. They played, I think, in the last couple of years. And Duke has just demolished Northwestern. So they have their number. Manny Diaz, first-year head coach, 7-1 against the spread as a single-digit dog Okay, over his career. Manny Diaz doesn't have a lot of good trends his way as a head coach. This is one of them. Uh, even though David Braun has done a fantastic job coaching Northwestern, taking over for Pat Fitzgerald. But I figured I'd throw that out there. And then the other game is the BYU-SMU game on Friday night, uh, Mark. And this is a game that uh, I actually am going to have as one of my double-digit upsets. I only had one last week. This week, uh, I have five. This is one of them. And I and, there, and again, sometimes I'm just taking double-digit upsets because of the fact that I might see a really good trend. Or I might uh, just say, you know what, I'm, 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 I really like the lineup. They probably won't win. But you know what, they're good enough to win. Anything's possible in college football on a weekly basis. So I'm going to go ahead and put them into the mix because your, your strategy on double digit upsets, because they're so large. And again, I'm, I'm always going to reference that if I say I'm doing a double digit upset, let's just use a hundred dollars. And then, so right now we're up 300 from the three to one. So that's how we're going to follow uh, my bank this year on those, on those features. But there are 340 on the money line. They beat SMU in the 22 bowl. That doesn't mean anything, but does mean something is they're nine and one against the spread in the last 10 is dogs of seven or more. When they take on an opponent off a double digit straight up win, they're also eight and two against the spread in their last 10 after they score 40 or more points. Um, and I, I just, uh, I, I'm not, I don't like what I see so far from SMU. I, I, I know they played a, cupcake team last week but the first week of the season they won against nevada which i'll talk about in a little bit who 
really has looked better than anybody thought they would look the first two games of the season, but still it's Nevada. They beat Nevada by scoring a touchdown with about a minute and a half left in the game or else they would have lost. They were down to Nevada. I think it was something like 28, 17 in the fourth quarter. They had a comeback right. to beat Nevada in that game. So I don't know what you got yet of SMU. Uh, BYU is always, it's kind of, you know, Sataki is a nice coach. He, he always has his team ready when they're overmatched against, you know, great power five teams, you pass on them, but I'm not so sure they're way overmatched against SMU. I don't think they are either, Greg. Uh, you know, uh, Rhett Lashley is the is the coach that uh, was mentioned in the talk about replacing Billy Napier, by the way, the SMU coach, uh, oh. because he does have some Florida ties. Uh, he, he does come in here with a pretty well-stocked offense. Uh, I'll give him that. He's only got TCU up on deck, so there's nothing – and the look ahead sensor like that alphabet war, if you will, but they're not going to look past BYU in a football game like this. Uh, you can find SMU just a little bit content here right now uh, off of that, that win last week. And uh, BYU is always dangerous as a big double digit dog. There are what I call big, ugly dogs. And those are the ones that you wouldn't want to touch with a 10 foot pole. Uh, but then there's big dogs that, uh, have a chance to win a football game. Live dog, that's a big dog. BYU would be a live double-digit dog. Yes. All right. Let's go into the games on Saturday. And we're going to go ahead and start with uh, the game that you talked about just a little bit, uh, Texas and Michigan. Matter of fact, uh, if you uh, if this is a great way to uh, promote your newsletter, uh, which you can also find. We'll have a link in the description so you can check it out. Uh, talk a little bit about the newsletter and uh, because there are two games we're going to be talking about that have uh, really the best uh, stats. Uh, you have the incredible stat in the Texas Michigan matchup and you have the awesome angle in one of the under the radar games that we'll, we'll get to Georgia tech and Syracuse. So talk about the newsletter. Well, the newsletter, uh, every game is written up in depth. Uh, I, I write up all the NFL football games. I have a staff that does the college and I feed them a lot of data to put that all together with. And altogether, it becomes a really, really invaluable tool each week. If you're looking for stats and information that you can't find anywhere else and putting edges in your favor, this is the newsletter for you, playbooksports.com. Check that out. We're talking about the Michigan-Texas football game here, and there's two stats in the game that jump out to me. Number one, Michigan, the football team that uh, I kind of put down because they won the championship last year. They lost a lot of players, and I thought they were going to become favored in games they shouldn't be and so forth and whatnot. Greg, they're a seven and a half point home underdog yeah. here. I mean, come on, man. Uh, but what you've got in Michigan here is a team that uh, whenever the last six times that they've taken on an SEC team and you find Michigan coming in off a double digit win the previous game, they've won and covered all six games. But the stat that jumps out in this football game to me, uh, and it is our incredible stat of the week, and uh, it's pretty strong, man. Uh, I'm going to read this to you right directly from the newsletter here. Uh, defending national champions – are 118 and 12 straight up at home since 1980 when they're coming off a home game with only four losses by more than seven points. That's a powerful stat. Defending national champion coming home off a home game, 118 and 12 with only four losses. That applies to Michigan this particular week here. And I'm not going to step in front of that. I'll be, I'll be the first one to tell you I will not do that. I like Michigan in the upset here. Uh, next week uh, on Tuesday evenings, Andy Isco from uh, thelogicalapproach.com and I are going to start our predict the lines uh, uh, report. And what this is going to entail is is that uh, and look, this is all about playing the, uh, the the honesty factor because the show wouldn't be any good if we just you know bullshit our way. I mean, right. How do we accomplish that? So what we're going to do is we're going to start the show by letting you know which games uh, that we predicted correctly. Uh, when you know before we looked at the lines then we're going to talk about the games we also were like way off on and and th that'll lead to some interesting discussions and then of course i'm going to use andy's expertise in the industry to look ahead at what he believes uh the lines might change like what specific games might have the most movement that you want to take advantage of um i bring that up because there were uh, you know we didn't do the, the show this week but we were close to doing it andy got really tied up it was such a busy week i and, and so we said you know what let's just start next week but i had already put my list together and this was one of them i th I, I had michigan as a 3.3 and a half point home dog i was really surprised that they were getting seven and a half 
So I was stunned. I really truly am. Now there was a big move made in the football game, uh, maybe largely because of the impressive win Texas had last week. Uh, the fact that Michigan was not all that impressive in their first win, combination of the two factors. But I think it's an overreaction to Texas and an underreaction to Michigan. Next game, let's talk about uh, – let's see. Let's talk about the other Big Ten team, Iowa, against the other Big 12 team. Well, I, I, Texas is no longer Big 12. Is Iowa State. Iowa State, Iowa, they play every year. And, look, I'm not a totals guy like Vic. But I'm imagined Vic uh, is – I can't – let's just put it this way. If I was going to try to be like a, uh, you know, a Swami and go, which game this year will Vic definitely pick the under? This would be <laughs> it. So, uh, I mean, there's even a, an under trend. Here it is. I believe – okay, now I didn't get this from your book. So uh, – because, you know, odds could change from one book to another – but I got this from Phil Steele's magazine, and it said that the under in this series is 17 and two in the last 19. So again, not sure if that's accurate, but it sounds pretty accurate. Even if it's off by a game or two, it's pretty impressive, and it's not surprising. Well, it's not surprising, and I think it probably uh, is at more apropos now than ever with this uh, snail-like offense that Iowa has brought to the table here. They were pathetic last year offensively. They're going to be a little bit better this year. But the sneaky part of this is Iowa State's going to be really sneaky good this year. So what you've got here is an Iowa team that's gotten off to a good start, feeling really good about themselves. Iowa State, who knows that they're a lot better than other people are giving them uh, credit for. And, in fact, I don't remember yet to refresh my mind if I had Iowa State to win the Big 12 or not, Greg. I, I, right now I don't recall. There's just so many names and teams going on. But I wouldn't be surprised at all to see them in the championship game. They're the number one team in the country and returning production, Iowa State is this year. This game means a lot to both teams here. Obviously, it's an in-state rivalry football game here. I've got to play the dog in a game like this. You had Oklahoma State versus Iowa State with Iowa State winning the Big 12. There we go. And I had Utah beating Iowa State in the Big 12. So we I, I heard a lot of Iowa State players, yes. <laughs> that's, Matt, that's Matt Campbell. Uh, yes. And and uh, and now no more, no more Texas and Oklahoma to worry about is huge. By the way, uh, this series is less six decided by ten or less. So under, even though the odds did go up from two to three and a half, I'm not too surprised by that. I actually thought the line was going to be three three and a half when it started. So I was a little surprised you started at two. But the road team has won the last two straight up and against the spread. And it's possible that maybe a new trend is developing there. Keep an eye on that. But Rocco Beck, the quarterback for Iowa State, is a young kid. He looked great last year, especially at the end of the year. That's part of the reason why that we really believed in this Iowa State team. They have Jalen Noel, Jaden Higgins at wide out. They've got a nice young uh, running back to keep an eye on, don't they always? Um, uh, by the way, Iowa State has covered five straight before a bye. I'm not so sure what – whether that is a luck trend or if it means anything, uh, but just, you know, because, because there are some trends that are just lucky. Um, do you think, do you think that's just a luck trend? Well, I know before a buy. Well, yeah, I, I, what you try and do is you try and look at the rationale of something that looks like it's maybe not logical. And I think the only rationale I could draw out of this is the fact that, Hey, we've got, we can let everything go in this football game. We've got nothing to get geeked up for, to prepare for next week, we're going to get a rest. So let's let it all out in this football game. That's about the only thing logical that would apply in a game like this. By the way, on the, on the uh, side that will favor Iowa, Iowa State just one and nine against the spread versus an opponent off a double digit straight up win. So keep that in mind. Um, and, and, and I don't, and I don't want to downplay Iowa either because um, uh, I actually, uh, you know, talked about Iowa uh, and put them in, uh, one of my top four conference future plays at 35 to one to win the big 10 uh, when we did our preseason preview show. Um, but I also had Iowa state as one of my top three win total wagers at over seven and a half. So yes, this is one of those games. I am just going to, you know, if I'm, I'm betting this game, I'm betting the under that's all I'm doing. I'm staying away from either team. I think it's gonna be a really good game to watch. Okay. Anything else? No, I agree. You know, I was only going to throw in the fact that uh, Iowa, while they're looking a lot better this year so far, it's really, really early. 
Uh, they've struggled at home hosting this team. They've lost them only nine of the last 12 times they played. But they're always a, they've always been the big brother against the redheaded yeah. stepchild in that sense. So you do get big efforts from Iowa State because they're underdogs more often than not in this series. Uh, Matt, then we've got a, a rematch from a, a, a slugfest, a low-scoring slugfest last year. Week three, I believe it was, Cal, Auburn. Auburn won that close game last year, 14-10. to 10. They were a four-and-a-half-point favorite. Okay, so now they're 13. So this is one of those situations I was talking about with Penn State and West Virginia. So Auburn was just a four and a half point favorite last year, and they barely and, and, and it didn't cover. Cal covered. Um, now it's up to thirteen. Yes, they're at home, so that's a difference. But we talked about Cal many times with Justin Wilcox being a really good team to play on in this particular spot. And what this spot is for Cal is they have covered now ten straight as non conference dogs over the last ten years. And I believe they also, you can say, I think it's also, I noticed in the, in the guide that there's two separate, that are very similar. I think they've also covered nine straight uh, as non-conference do- road dogs versus power five teams. So either way, it really works out in Cal's favor regarding that trend. Keep an eye on the fact that Auburn is 0-5 against the spread as a favorite of more than five. When they take on a team with a 500 or greater winning percentage, coming in with revenge off of a straight up win. I just also think that this line got a little inflated because Cal played UC Davis. They struggled early. It it really wasn't a a typical blowout kind of situation, but I I just, I mean, you know, I think this was one of those deals. And, and, And on the flip side, Auburn just annihilated their, their opponent. They looked really good. They put up a ton of points, but I think the the difference was, I think Cal I could, I could buy that they were just holding back for next week's game, whereas Auburn and Hugh Freeze really wanted to get off to a positive start. They had a, a bunch of young uh, uh, new kids coming in, uh, freshman uh, receivers, transfer receivers. Uh, they wanted to get Peyton Thorne going. They got a new offensive coordinator. So I really, and, and if you look at it, uh, and, and I did an interview with Brian Matthews from Rivals, who covers the Auburn Tigers the other day after the game, and he did point out the fact that uh, if you look at it, uh, I think every touchdown except the first one was scored by either a true freshman, uh, you know, top recruit, true freshman, or a transfer wide receiver. So they got all of their new guys in, into the game. And I think they had six touchdowns of 34 or yards more. That's how electric their offense was. So that's the reason why I think that line is the way that it is. But I I'm willing to go the other way and say, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm not sure I'm buying all that after playing FCS opponents. I think Cal is going to be a lot tougher than people think this week. I think they are this year too as well. Uh, and, you know, people might like Hugh Freeze. He knows how to win money against the spread, so forth and whatnot. But I like the coach on the other side better. I think he's a much better head coach, uh, Justin Wilcox. Uh, and the manner in which Auburn won last week, uh, I believe, the, correct me if I'm wrong, I think they scored nine touchdowns in their first nine possessions, something, something like, like that. that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I have to ask you, did they play the Alabama A&M football team or the band? I, I don't get that. I mean, you know, you schedule teams like this, you pay them $550,000 to come on and get the snot beat out of them, and the next week the public wants to wrap their arms around you. I think that's a false signal for Auburn in a game like this. I think California is a live dog in this contest. And uh, don't forget, Cal's an ACC team uh, now. Uh, and, and I do believe Auburn is is going to have a better year. And a matter of fact, I'm giving Auburn maybe two years, and they're going to be back to the way the old Auburn uh, program was. He's doing a phenomenal job recruiting right now, and it's just going to be a matter of time. So keep an eye on Auburn in the future. This year, I think it's too early for them to contend for a championship, but they're definitely going to be a better team than they were last year. Okay, uh, next game. Uh, let's just throw in um, uh, a few more here. Uh, let's see. We've got Texas San Antonio, Texas State. The reason I wanted to talk about this one was, once again, the line. I was very surprised when the line opened one Texas State. It's now one Texas San Antonio, so it's it's moving in the right direction in my mind. Uh, I thought there would be a three-point favorite. Keep in mind that uh, last year 
They uh, UTSA beat Texas State by seven at home as a 13 point favorite. Maybe they had something to, to you know to play here. But how about this? I did some of this homework, and again, this was all based out of the out of the guide. Okay, so if you look, you'll find out that uh, the Texas State. Actually, the, the UTSA, if we're just going by the UTSA and we're only talking about their side of the stats, you'll see that right in the uh, section, right at the top, when you're reading the magazine, it's, it's right here. Uh, it'll say, stat you will like. UTSA is 19-0 straight up, 13-4-1 ATS in games in which they win the turnover battle on the Jeff Trailer. Normally, I don't care about those because that's well. I'm not going to know how that I'm going to can use that until after the game. But this is the perfect situation for me to use this because Texas State was 129th in the country last year in fumbles lost, and also I said, "Oh, that's interesting." Texas State not very good, by the way. You can also find that stat right here for Texas State, uh, a stat you will like. 129th and fumbles lost. What did they do last week in their first game of the season against Lamar? First of all, they only beat Lamar by seven at home. That's not very impressive. Secondly, they lost two turnovers uh, in the game. So they lost a turnover battle. One of by those two, was a by two net, you're saying? Yeah. And yes. they, they gave up a fumble. So once again, they're showing signs that they, they're, they're, they're going to turn the ball over. And if they turn the ball over and they fumble the football and UTSA wins the turnover battle, well, you know what that means. UTSA is going to win the football game. To me, though, that's just a cherry on top stat. Like I said, I thought they were a three-point favorite in the first place. Um, I was a little bit shocked that they were getting disrespected by Texas State being the favorite here. Well, you know, these are two football teams that I really like. Uh, one of them stays way under the radar, Texas State. UTSA is getting its due right now. Jeff Trailer is getting a lot of a, a lot of likes, uh, and they wrapped him up and signed him to a really good contract because he was going to be scarfed up real quick by an SEC team. So they knew what they were doing, or a Big 12 team, either or. Uh, so there's two programs on the rise here. I like G.J. Kinney, the head coach at Texas State. Uh, he's doing oh, a yeah. real solid job. I of agree. Former- former quarterback, and he's got this program turned around in the right direction. You go back and look at last week's game that you brought, that you called out, Greg, here. And, you know, they lost the football game, uh, or won the game at 34 to 27, I believe it was. Yeah. They, yeah, they struggled, but they murdered them in the yards. They beat them 485 to 288, almost 200 yards in the stats of victory in that game for Texas State. They know they dominated their opponent in that football game. Now, maybe a couple of those turnovers were key turnovers where they end up costing them scores because Probably. of situations. Yes, and you, the, the, the last thing they'll need to do is turn the ball over here and be on the short end of turnovers here again. If they can protect the football, and that's a big if, I think they can win this football game. Yes, that's something that we'll definitely going to follow without question because, yeah, you, you actually – did you actually, did you pick Texas State? Because uh, you might have to, to, uh, to either as a, uh, a sleeper. Uh, as a sleeper, or- yes. Yeah, because you did like Texas State yes. uh, in the uh, – what are they in? Uh, which conference? Sunbelt. Yes. Uh, actually, you have Texas State winning the Sunbelt. So, there we go. <laughs> yeah. And remember, UTSA, they're in the AAC. So they're right. no longer uh, one of those uh, Conference USA uh, – because that's where they were, I believe, a few years ago. Conference USA, right? That's where UTSA was? Yeah, they're so. they're sort of playing the alphabet game right now, as far yeah. as conferences are concerned. But yeah. uh, you know, you know where they are, Greg. Is there anywhere where the, other than where they need <laughs> to be? They need to be in a conference down south around Texas somewhere that people can identify with. But that's the world we live in today. All right, let's go to another big one: Tennessee at North Carolina State. And this was almost like too easy for me to add that to the double-digit uh, uh, upsets this week. Uh, it was almost like academic uh, because. Um, uh, again, I have North Carolina State winning the ACC championship this year. Uh, I think the reason that the line has gone up, again, I, I just think it's 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 people are looking at what happened in last week's game and they go, oh, I don't like. I think North Carolina State they struggled against an FCS team and yeah, I, they weren't they were just a middle of the pack team to begin with. So yeah, look at Tennessee. They got that hot shot young quarterback. He looked great. Uh, oh yeah, Tennessee, SEC, ACC. Uh, even though it's a neutral site game in Carolina, so I think that's why the line went up. Look, maybe Tennessee wins the game and covers. We know how talented they are. 
Um, but uh, I, I, I think that if you watch the game, you saw a quarterback, Grayson McCall, call that was really off his game. Uh, and he's a very accurate passer. So uh, I don't expect that to continue. Um, and the team they played, by the way, wasn't a wasn't a, a, a chump FCS team. That was a pretty good team that they were playing from the SCS. Um, but anyway, the fact is, is it's a big spread. I don't believe North Carolina State is is going to be uh, in a situation where if they lose the point spread battle, they're losing it before the fourth quarter. Meaning, I think if they lose the point spread battle, I think they're going to lose it because it's a one score game, and Tennessee scores scores a touchdown mid fourth takes the two score lead and, and that's the end and Tennessee covers. I just don't think it's going to be as easy as maybe some people believe it could be. Well, I know where you were going in this game because I know of, uh, of your infatuation with McCall and rightfully so. Uh, and you like this football team, rightfully so. Uh, if you've been on them for, since last season, they've won and covered six straight games in a row, really flying under the radar NC state. And I don't think it'll be that way for all too long. This game's got upset potential written on it for me, for NC state. Uh, and the site I think favors them as well. It's yeah. in Carolina. They're a Carolina t- team. I don't know how well Tennessee travels. Probably well, I'm going to guess probably well, but uh, NC state in Carolina as the dog, give me the wolf pack here. Yeah. They're 275 on the money line. Uh, by the way, they're, they're, they're trends that uh, favor Tennessee, They've covered six straight versus non-conference. NC State just one and six against the spread uh, when they're playing uh, as conference dogs of more than three points. As non-conference dogs of more than three points. And uh, but, like you said, they have covered six straight, and that is yeah. meaningful. Okay, uh, the next game we're going to talk about is Colorado and Nebraska, and this is another line that I was completely off on. Uh, you know, maybe it was me. I don't know where you had it. Maybe you had it at seven, but. I actually had Nebraska as 14-point favorite. I thought that uh, I saw enough of the week one game and enough of that freshman quarterback to believe that, yes, Matt Rule is definitely turning this team around. We're not putting them in as one of the top four teams in the Big Ten. I'm not saying that. But they're that next group. And uh, they're playing a Colorado team that uh, barely hang, hung on to beat an FCS team, another one of these typical uh, Colorado games that we've seen from Sanders the, 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 you know, since he's been our head coach. They're just overmatched on the line of scrimmage. You throw in the fact that they, they, their defense is still sus- suspect. Now, the, the, other, the, the one thing that work, they got working for them is they are 3-0, straight up and against the spread against Nebraska, the last three in this series, uh, including the 36-4 to team home win last year yes. as a two-point favorite. So – uh, now they're being a seven-point dog. Again, you know, you could use that in your favor if you like Colorado. Um, but, look, obviously I'm going to take Nebraska because I think the spread was way off that I thought it was going to be. So I, I, I've got to take Nebraska in this spot. I can see this being a great game. I, I love the, the rivalry. I'm glad they're playing again. But I could also see this where maybe Nebraska scores a couple of scores late because they're just wearing down Colorado. I agree. Uh, I'm not a big Colorado fan any at all. You know, I don't like the way that uh, Deion Sanders goes about uh, recruiting players. He was paying players well before he got the, the green light to do so. We know that, and uh, it didn't sit well with me. Uh, and he was all talk and didn't deliver the goods last year. I mean, all this offseason rhetoric, uh, all this acclaim, they got out to a start in that win in that first football game, and they fell like the bridge over the River Kwai last year. Uh, now they're coming into this football game feeling pretty good about themselves. But in Nebraska, you've got a thing in this football game. I call it the golden rule. And it's rule, R-H-U-L-E, as in Matt Rule. And Matt Rule really dominates in college football career in the second year with the football program. His teams are 45 and 23 straight up and 42 and 22 to the spread in year two after year one with the football program. That's exactly this road that he's got Nebraska on right now. They're believing it. Uh, and I think this golden rule comes into effect here. I like Nebraska by the 14 you thought they should be favored by. All right. And then we got a couple more to go. App State and Clemson. This one in Death Valley. Uh, Clemson, we talked about their uh, uh, ugly loss to Georgia, offensively speaking. 16 and a half is the spread. Uh, the money line is dropped from 650 to 525. Uh, but this one, uh, again, to me, was an absolute no-brainer as far as a double-digit upset play. 
because it's almost like we talked about Florida State and Clemson, almost like tying them together. And we saw what happened at Florida State in week two. Now, they didn't have the travel and all that kind of stuff. And they were in a game they maybe should have won and all that. They were a favorite. Clemson's coming in differently. You know, they, they were the dog. They're playing maybe the best team in college football. So it is different. But there are a few things that I think uh, work against Clemson here. And that is the fact that th they had to be mentally just, you know, I mean, their confidence level it must not be very good right now. Uh, you had the whole offseason. This is going to be different. You're, we're going to go out there and show everybody. And they didn't show anybody. They looked the same old Clemson. App State, meanwhile, we, all, we know what App State can do in this spot. Since 2019, they're two and three straight up, four and one against the spread in the in the last five versus power five teams. One of the losses, straight up ATS, was that wild 63 to 61 loss as a three-point home favorite to North Carolina. So that's the way App State plays big uh, power five teams. They've also covered six straight as a dog of six or more. And Clemson is one and six against the spread in their last seven after scoring 10 points or less. So I love the point spread, but I just figured, you know what? It is possible that Clemson right now, their psyche is, is not in a good space. They're not playing an ACC team. So this is not going to work against them. Neither did the first one. So even if they lose this game, it means nothing because they could run the table and win the ACC championship and still go to the playoffs. So I, I just think this is a good spot for App State. I think it's a great spot for App State here. You mentioned you hit it right on the head. Clemson has problems. They're not playing well. All this, all this boohooing going on about Clemson not taking advantage of the transfer portal. Dabo Swinney sticking to his guns, and Dabo Swinney came up, coming up short week after week. I just wonder how many press conferences he's got left in him where he can he can just throw the BS out there and you know keep winning the press over here. That was a pitiful performance last week. And what I think works for Appalachian State in a football game like this, we put this in this week's newsletter, and this is really a nice stat. Since Appalachian State came on board as an FBS team, and I think it was 2014, right around there in that, in that range there, there are only four other teams that have more road wins than does Appalachian State. And those four other teams are teams like Ohio State, Boise State, Alabama, and Clemson. Fifth is Appalachian State. This team knows how to win games away from the mountain, off the mountain, and I think they can take this game right down to the wire as well. All right. Now, uh, I'm just going to run through uh, some of these other games uh, that um, I think are of interest to, to just bring up uh, for everybody. Um, let's see. We've got uh, Baylor and Utah. Uh, so this is going to be an important game for Baylor. Uh, of course, Dave Aranda's back to call and plays as far as the defensive coordinator, so good for him. Also, they've got that quarterback, uh, Finn, who is uh, Mr. All-Everything uh, in the MAC for Toledo, so we'll see what he can do for Baylor. Uh, Utah, meanwhile, Cam Rising's back, five touchdown passes last week. Brant uh, Keithy is back as well. The star tight end had three of those touchdowns. Utah's 8-2 and two is a home favorite the last 10. They beat Baylor last year by 7 as a 7-point road favorite. Here it's 15. Baylor's a 5-1 to one money line play. They're 12-1 and one against the spread off a non-conference game versus a conference opponent. Uh, I also wanted to bring up Jacksonville State and, and get your opinion because I, I was a little bit surprised that the, that the uh, spread in this one uh, had ballooned all the way up uh, to 30. That's what it is right now. Uh, Louisville was a 30-point favorite against Jack State. Keep in, uh, keep in mind, though, Rich Rod is only 6-18 and 18 against the spread uh, in his career uh, when he loses a game as a favorite. Uh, and he's 0-7 and against the spread in uh, if those games are non-conference, which this one is at Louisville. So those trends are saying, go ahead and take Louisville and give the 30. Um, uh, by the way, Tyler Shuck, the quarterback, uh, who needs to stay healthy at four touchdowns for Louisville last week. But, yeah, did you think this was going to be a 30-point spread? No, I didn't, uh, but I'm not surprised either. Louisville is getting a lot of love right now in Vegas, and I think it's going to only continue until they have a big showdown game against another big uh, big power four football team here. you got Jacksonville State. A little bit of the shine come off of this football team. Uh, in 2023, they won nine games in their first year as an FBS team. I mean, that alone is worth some kind of an award or something to that effect. But all of a sudden, they're being exposed this football season. Is it game film they have on them? Is it tougher opposition? I don't know. 
But all I know is if I'm Jacksonville State, I do not want to be playing Louisville because I think they're a real power sleeper team here right now. I'm going to let this game go because I'm that much in love with Louisville. Yeah, they, they lost a lot of players, uh, Jacksonville State, some key players. I think that definitely has a lot to do with it. By the way, Louisville's schedule is going to get really tough really fast after the bye next week. They go home Georgia Tech at Notre Dame and home SMU. Then, two weeks later, home Miami at Boston College at Clemson. Wow. That's a tough schedule for Louisville. So, they better definitely take care of business here. Maybe rush their players. Uh, I talked about the Eastern Michigan-Washington trends, uh, which really were crazy because it's tough to take either side based on them. Eastern Michigan and Chris Creighton, 33-11 and 11 against the spread. Their last 44 as road dogs, including 10 and 4 since 22. They were a road dog last week at UMass and won the game outright. Uh, Washington, meanwhile, Jed Fish has covered nine straight, taking on opponents with a win percentage of 700 or more. And Washington has covered 11 straight as non-conference favorites of less than 28. The spread, though, has dropped from 27 and a half to 24 and a half in the last 24 hours. And the money line has dropped from 22 to one to 13 to one. So I think there are a lot of people out there that are believing in this Chris Creighton uh, underdog legacy. Well, I'm a big Chris Creighton fan, and uh, he's doing a masterful job, I think. That 33 and 11 stat as a road dog, that's about as good as it gets in college football. Uh, you got to re- absolutely respect a stat like that. And then in Washington, you got a football team here now. They may have their focus a little bit more on Washington State next week. Uh, maybe the renewal of the Apple Cup. I don't even know if that's truly in effect this year. And they usually play them at the end of the football season. They're going to catch them next week. So I think they've got bigger fish to fry next week to the Huskies than they do in Eastern Michigan this week. I think Eastern Michigan increases the 34 and 11 road dog under Chris Creighton. All right. And then the other uh, couple of ones I wanted to mention uh, were Lafayette at Kennesaw state. Now I watched some of that Texas San Antonio uh, Kennesaw state game. And again, it was a little bit closer, which is probably another reason why people were wondering about Texas San Antonio this year. Cause they locked Frank Harris, a quarterback, but do you know who the quarterback is? Of UT San Antonio, the UTSA. I, I should have mentioned this when we were talking about it. I think you may have talked about this on our podcast. I'm not 100% certain, but uh, it's a quarterback that uh, people are going to hear and they're going to say, wow, that's pretty nice. Uh, who was it? I can't remember. It's Josh McCown's son. Oh, wow. No, you didn't. And, and he's a lefty. That. Oh, wow. Really? Nice. Yeah. So wow. he, he looked pretty good. You know, nice. so he's got, uh, you know, they, they had something going there. So, uh, yeah, so uh, keep an eye on Josh McCown's son. But, but but anyway, Kennesaw State, actually, I thought they looked pretty decent considering they're just a first-year FBS team. Uh, by the way, they won – they lost um, uh, in their last – at the end of the – actually, overall last season, I think they had uh, seven or six losses. Five of those six losses were by one score. The other was by 10 points. And – they lost at Sam Houston. We're going to talk about that in a second. They lost at Sam Houston by three points as a 17-point dog. Their head coach is a 10-year head coach of that program, so they're a stable program. And 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 what I and so I was really intrigued by them. Then I saw the trends. Lafayette five and thirteen against the spread. Their last eighteen is a road favorite. Lafayette one and ten against the spread. Their last eleven after they scored thirty-five or more points. Lafayette one and eight against the spread. Their last nine on the road off a non-conference game. And Lafayette zero oh, and six against the spread. Their last six is a road favorite off a double-digit straight-up win. All of those trends uh, say to take Kennesaw. I'm taking Kennesaw, and they are also going to be one of my money line plays at five to one. They should be a money line play. Uh, I'm not really sold on Louisiana. You know, not since uh, Billy Napier left the program. And not that he's doing anything in my in Florida, but uh, they're not the same Louisiana team, and they still carry a lot of that same weight. Uh, this head coach, DeSormo, I think his first name is Michael, uh, he's really struggled in roles like this. Uh, he's 3-9 and nine straight up and against the spread, coming off of a double-digit win uh, the next football game in, in the lines of 14 minus 14 or more. I got to stay with Kennesaw State here. I think the momentum is going to continue this week, and they'll expose the Raging Cajuns. All right. And then uh, the other two games, one of them is Tulsa at Arkansas State. Nobody probably cares about this. This will be one of uh, 20 ESPN Plus games that nobody will watch unless you're a Tulsa, Arkansas State fan, or if you're going to take Tulsa like I did. Uh, Don't forget Kevin Wilson is our head coach. He's the former head coach at Indiana. 
a very good offensive coordinator. This is his second year. But what I liked about Tulsa is I did some homework on him, obviously, and I wanted to find out, um, you know, if, if, if he's got something going this year. And what I like is I like what they're doing on offense, as you well should. You know, Wilson's an offensive guy. They've got a pretty good quarterback. He's a redshirt freshman. He looked pretty good from what I saw in the game. Um, and they ended last year one and three in the last four. But all of those, uh, but the three uh, that they lost were by seven or less, including a 24-22 loss at Tulane at the end of the season. They also won their game at the end of the season against East Carolina as a three-point road dog. That was the last game of the season. So they ended the season strong They've in his first season. They've started off uh, good after last week. And now come the two trends that really cemented it for me. 13-2-1 against the spread in the last 16 as a road dog for Tulsa. And 20-2 and two against the spread, their last 22 on the road when you take on an opponent with a win percentage of 600 or more. Of course, Arkansas State won their game last week. It was not an impressive win. They had a comeback late to beat Central Arkansas, an FCS team. Uh, so uh, I like Tulsa, obviously, uh, with the seven and a half points. I would say this, Greg, uh, I think it's a six-word phrase. An upset does not surprise me in a football game like this. Uh, Tulsa brings some really fierce numbers, as you just called out, especially on the road in situations just like this. And I don't know why the opponent warrants laying more than a touchdown in a football game. I'm with you. I like the Golden Hurricane plus the points here. And then the last one before we move on, South Alabama is a two-point favorite at Ohio. I, I like Ohio in this one because uh, I, I just think, look, Major Applewhite's a pretty decent coach, but it's his first year there. They lost their first game of the season last week to get off to a, a sluggish start. Uh, and also Ohio is 9-2 and two against the spread. They're less 11 as a home dog, including 4-0 the last two years. They have a much more stable head coach. Matter of fact, their head coach just won the MAC. Uh, the uh, the um, uh, coach of the year just a couple of years ago. So uh, I, I just think this is a good spot for Ohio at home uh, as a two-point dog coming off a game in which they really hung in there against Syracuse for a little bit. Uh, offensively, they, they don't have, of course, the quarterback that they had once, the kid Rourke, who's now at Indiana. Uh, big difference there, but still, they're a pretty solid MAC program, and uh, and I just thought I'd throw that in there as well. Well, you've got uh, in South Alabama, we did a, a thing in our smart mark box every week. We share a handicapping secret. This week it's called Bowler Blues. And basically what it says is you fade teams in game two that lost game one if they were a bowl team the previous year. And these teams are sort of like sulk. They don't come oh. back strong. You've got South Alabama in this particular role here this week. In Ohio, you look at them. Uh, they're 11 and one, uh, straight up at home here of late here. I think this is a live dog here in Ohio. I agree with you. All right. And then, um, I have one more double digit upset, uh, that I have in my tank. I had, we already went through four of them, BYU, Kennesaw state, NC state, and app state. The last one is one of the lines that I just was really surprised by really surprised. I mean, look, I, the more I thought about it, I started to try to understand it, and, and, I, and I do. I understand it, but I still am shocked by the line, and that is Virginia Tech and Marshall. I just I, – I didn't understand why Virginia Tech is a 21-point favorite, a 20-point favorite in the spot. Marshall is considered one of the top teams in the Sun Belt this year. The Sun Belt. That's, that's a good conference, and they're considered one of the top teams in, in the conference. Virginia Tech just opened the season – yeah, you want to give props to Vandy and 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 Pavi, the quarterback. It's a nice story. It's a gutsy kid. It's a gutsy win, but it's still Vanderbilt. And 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 I, I, I and it's uh, go back to what we talked about with Penn State, West Virginia, last year. Virginia Tech played Marshall at Marshall. Marshall was a six-point favorite in the game and beat Virginia Tech twenty-four to seventeen. It was week three. Out yardage them 380 to 343. Now, one year later, they're on the road as a 20 point dog. I just think it's, I don't, and I was like, I was looking for things. I'm like, what am I missing here? And I couldn't find anything. So, look, we know Virginia Tech's a more talented team than Marshall. They very well might blow them out after what happened last week. They were embarrassed. We both like Virginia Tech and think they're going to have a better year this year. But I just think that this line is just a little out of whack. 
I think it's one of the worst lines of the week. I agree with you, Greg. Uh, no respect at all for Marshall, and the love for Virginia Tech is overflowing. I don't know why, especially after their opening performance uh, this season here. Uh, I like this Marshall football team. I like what they do, the way they go about with their program here. I think, correct me if I'm wrong, I think we wrote this in the newsletter, has Marshall been to like 12 bowl games in a row? Impossible. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And Impossible. here they are, this kind of a dog to Virginia Tech, who – Made a bowl last year, lost their seat. Did they lose their season opener or not cover? Correct me if I'm wrong. No, they lost to Vanderbilt, yeah. and they were a 13-point favorite on the road. Okay, another bowler with the Blues here at Virginia Tech. And what are they laying a monster number to a team that can play? You know, this has got to be a money line play for you, Greg. It is. They were 8-1, yeah. to one and I, I, I just have to grab it. And, again, it's one of those money line plays that if you hit it, you've now I've now put myself in a position where I could do eight free money line plays right uh, based you, on my hundred hundred dollar system so you're going to guarantee yourself a winning day if you hit this oh hit without question i could right. lose my other five and, yes. and uh, on my head uh yeah. by the way also marshall has covered seven straight after allowing less than seven six and one ats last seven on the road off a straight up non-conference win covered eight straight as dogs of seven or more versus an opponent off a straight up loss and virginia tech is zero and seven against the spread in the last seven versus an opponent off a double-digit straight-up win. So on top of all that, I throw all those trends in there to back up Marshall. Okay, now I've got to ask you, uh, Mark, last, this is what I'll ask you last each week and uh, for college, when we, and if we're going to move on to the NFL. Not going to be a long segment for the NFL this week, but what we're going to talk about with college each week at this time is I've got a bunch of games that I'm going to ask you about that I think are considered under-the-radar games, and you're going to tell me which one of those games, if you had to just pick one to watch. So we've already talked about Marshall, Virginia Tech, and BYU, SMU, but we haven't talked about these other games. Uh, Georgia Tech at Syracuse, which has the awesome angle in the newsletter. Pittsburgh at Cincinnati. Sam Houston at Central Florida. Georgia Southern at Nevada. Mississippi State at Arizona State. Let's start with the Georgia Tech-Syracuse game because Georgia Tech's a three-point favorite. It's the first time they're a road favorite since 2021. And anytime you, you, you know that a team is dealing with that kind of history, you always have to be a little bit apprehensive about taking that type of favorite. We know Georgia Tech will probably end up with a better record than Syracuse this year. We've already seen how good they are, but this is still a tough spot for them. This is where Georgia Tech suffers a tire blowout this week. After what they've done to open the season with two wins and two covers, starting out in Ireland uh, and then winning again last week, this is where it ends. Teams that start out with two wins and two covers and go road favorite are in terrible situations and you got a Syracuse football team that's probably going to be bowling this year. I got to like the orange and the upset in this game. Yeah, this is uh, uh, and also if you take a look at uh, the other trend, uh, Georgia Tech one and eight as favorites versus an opponent with revenge, as Georgia Tech beat Syracuse last year. Uh, and then quickly, uh, I just want to reference that Georgia Southern Nevada game because I thought that line was to be a little bit bigger than one. But when you look at Nevada, they're off to a really nice start with first-year head coach Jeff Choate. As I mentioned, they almost beat SMU to start the season. They went to Troy last week. Troy is not the same Troy, no more Summerall, but they still upset Troy on the road. So we might have to be keeping an eye on Nevada, but I just think Georgia Southern just impressed the hell out of me last week, which how talented they were. They've got a nice young quarterback. They've got explosive offense under Ty Helton, the former USC coach. Um, but hey, maybe Nevada's for real. You know, I don't know. I just thought this line was going to be seven, not one. Well, you know, the bad thing for Georgia Southern here is not only is it a non-conference game, it's up in the mountains in the altitude. And that's not good for a team in Georgia uh, doing just that. Uh, I think you're going to find a big effort by Nevada in this football game. I wouldn't be surprised if they win the game. Yeah, I, I, you know, again, do a little bit more homework on Nevada, and it does make you wonder. Sam Houston, again, that was our pick last week, the, the money line play. Uh, so you know how strong we feel about them. Uh, but this is a different monster. They're taking on Central Florida. We know how good Central Florida could be this year. 21 is a lot of points, though. The money line has dropped from 11 to 1 to 850. So there is some money coming in on Sam Houston. But Central Florida is just 6 and 13 against the spread. Their last 19 is a home favorite. That's over the last four years. And Sam Houston is now on a run where they're 6 and 2 ATS as a road dog, including the straight up win last week and 4 and 1 straight up. 4-0 against the spread in the last five overall. 
Yeah, who does uh, UCF have on deck next week? Because uh, this could be a real bad flat spot for them. You know, like you said, you're not keen on laying big points, big uh, numbers like this in a football game. I didn't, I didn't even look yet. I don't know. Do they have anybody looking ahead that they could possibly look past Sam Houston at? Yeah, it's their hall, it's their road uh, Big Twelve opener at TCU. Okay, that, that, that's a that's a good game. Yeah. Yes, it is. So yep. that's that's something that definitely could fall into play as well. Uh, okay, and then uh, just a couple of others that I was mentioning there. Pittsburgh at Cincinnati. Remember when when, when we talked about Pittsburgh and wondered whether or not this was going to be it for Pat Narduzzi this year? <laughs> I, I might be wrong. I mean, they have changed their offense, and all for the better. They, they have this offensive coordinator, uh, uh, Bell. He comes from Western Carolina. They have a new up-tempo offense. Uh, they've got this dynamic kid from Western Carolina uh, who is a dynamic uh, player. He had, a, he had one of the top punt returns of the week last week in college football. He, he's really – and they have a quarterback who is an Alabama transfer. He's only, uh, I think, a redshirt freshman or a, a redshirt sophomore. Um, and their offense looked really good. So – um, but look, it, it, it's still it's still a, a, a team from the MAC. This is Cincinnati. Cincinnati's a two point favorite. Keep in mind they lost their top defender before the season began, Dante Corleone, the Godfather. So he's out for the year. They upset Pitt last year as a seven point road dog, um, uh, but now they're the favorite at home two over over uh, Pitt. Um, here's the big stat that favors Pitt. 12 and 0 against the spread as a road dog with revenge when they take on an opponent off a straight up win. That's enough for me, Greg, especially the revenge, the manner in which it happened last year, losing the game straight up at home as a favorite. Now coming back in a cross river rivalry like this, I'd like Pitt in the upset to answer right back this year. And the last two games, I just wanted to mention the Mississippi State Arizona State uh, game because I was really surprised that the line uh, opened at six. Really shocked. I thought Mississippi State was going to be a six-point favorite. I know Arizona State looks like they're heading in the right direction. They had a really nice win against Wyoming to start the season. That is not the same Wyoming team. They're going to be in big trouble without Craig Ball. But And look, I like them. I think this will be a nice uh, program to keep an eye on. But this is still an SEC team. And by the way, Blake Shapin, the Baylor transfer quarterback, now has Jeff Levy, the first-year head coach for Mississippi State, one of the top offensive coordinator assistants in the game, head coach for the first time. Shapin looks like a different man. He looks like the guy Baylor thought they were going to recruit or thought they had recruited. And uh, Mississippi State has covered six straight as a non-conference road dog of less than eight, and they're five and one against the spread in their last six as dogs of nine or less after they score 35 or more. I, I just, I'm just surprised that this is a six point dog situation for Mississippi state. So I think this is a play for me on the bulldogs. Well, you've got a Southeast conference dog who is live in a football game like this, and you're not beating a monster in Arizona state. I think you have to grab the points with the rebel or the, I should say the bulldog in this football game. And the last one, I forgot to talk about this before, but that's the Boise state, Oregon game and Boise state. Uh, here's the thing to keep an eye on. It's a 20 point spread and everybody might be, and I, I think is even though Tony Mejia, one of our playbook experts on your weekly show believes that Oregon got pushed around and believed it was more of Oregon may not be as good as people think. I'm not going to go that way uh, yet. I'm willing to give him another week because um, I just, I, I, I just can't believe that there, you know, there's nothing that, that tells me yet that they're just all of a sudden not a talented football team, considering they didn't lose like a million players. So let's also keep this in mind. Boise State in the last four games against Pac-12 opponents have lost all four by a 163 to 65 margin, including last year. They lost their, their bowl game. Uh, they lost two of them last year, including the bowl game to UCLA, 35 to 22. I'm also not sure about their head coach. I think their new head coach who got the job late in the season, won the job because he, he got the team rolling at the end, uh, this kid Danielson. I'm not so sure he's the right guy at Boise. Um, and I think, and look, last week they gave up a ton of points and yards to Georgia Southern. So, look, I love Genty. As we talked about, I think Boise will probably put some points on the board, but I just think Oregon is going to score for days in this game, and I'd be a little bit apprehensive to take Boise in this spot. But, hey, you never know. Maybe Tony's right. Maybe Oregon is not as good as we think. Well, to me, it's just like uh, bringing a race car into the pits 
you know, because he's, the cylinders aren't firing, and that's Oregon right here. And uh, I don't know if I want to send him back out of the pits and ask him to win this, uh, to, to win by 20 laps, uh, which is what basically he's going to have to do. That's a big number. That's a big number. Exactly right. Uh, I respect the Boise numbers here. I mean, my goodness, the better the opposition, the better they are, especially as dogs 19 and 5 as a dog against a 750 or better opponent, 5 and 0 oh, when they're a double digit dog in this role. I think Boise is the, like I mentioned before, I think they're uh, the group of five team that's going to be selected for the playoff, if not them, Memphis. And this is their chance to stand up and shine. Yep. 